And now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Ellen Peters. Ellen is the Philip H. Knight Chair and Director of the Center for Science Communication Research in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. An expert in decision making and the science of science communication, her primary research interests are how people judge and decide and how evidence-based communication can boost comprehension and improve decisions related to health, finances, and the environment. She joins us this evening for a particularly timely conversation about COVID-19 antibody tests and what they can and cannot tell us about our immunity to the virus. Welcome. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me here, Andrea. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to, as, as, uh, as, as, as we were saying, uh, I'm going to talk a bit today about how you can understand and interpret the numbers behind antibody tests for COVID-19. They're a bit complicated, but they're also super, super interesting. And it's actually one of my favorite things to teach to, teach to undergrads. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to use something called Bayes' theorem to help us understand uh, the question, are you immune if you test positive for COVID-19 antibodies? And in case anybody forgot, like any of us could, COVID-19 is here. Um, but it's actually been around for less than a year. The first case was reported to WHO last November. And, and it's, of course, highly contagious. And we can ignore it, as some do. We could instead run from it because it's just too scary. Or we can make evidence-based decisions about how dangerous it is, who to listen to, what mitigation or protective strategies exist, and how effective are they, and what trade-offs to make between health, mental health, and the economy, both short-term as well as long-term. And, and today's talk is in this, lat this latter tradition of making evidence-based decisions. Before we go forward, though, I want to let you know what I'm not. So I am not a virologist and I'm not an epidemiologist. I'll do my best with if you have some questions like that, but it's not my area of expertise. Um, I'm a, instead, I'm a decision scientist. I was trained in psychology and in the psychology of how we make decisions. And I'm interested, it, right now, I'm interested in how people make decisions in the face of pandemic statistics, but also other statistics, and, and often, often in health. And in particular today, I'm interested in whether you can have a get out of COVID jail free card if you test positive on a COVID-19 antibody test. I started thinking about the promise of these antibody tests um, when, my friend, when my friend Doug announced over Facebook that he thought he had COVID. Uh, he said at the time he, he only had mild symptoms and he didn't actually know anyone else with it, so he wasn't positive that he had it. Uh, and at that point in time, he couldn't get a test because it, it was back a while ago. This was back in late February. So it was very, very early in the pandemic in the US. Uh, you, you might recall, for example, that President Trump declared a national emergency uh, not until March 13th. So it was almost a month before that, um, that, that Doug thought that, that he had had COVID. More recently, though, he tested positive for COVID. COVID-19 antibodies, and he immediately wanted to travel. He had time off from work. There were really cheap airfares out there, but he wasn't sure if he could do so safely for himself as well as for other people. And the question for him and the question for us today is, should he travel? It seems like he could since the test said that he had the antibodies. But when it, when it really comes down to it, um, the, the question is, is he immune so that he can't get it himself and he can't pass it on to other people? And by the way, I'm, I'm going to use the word immune when I really mean um, he, he has COVID consistent antibodies based on a serology test, but the word immune is way quicker. So I'm going to use that today. Despite the promise of his test result, it turns out that Doug can't know for certain whether he's immune or not, but he can know how likely it is that he's immune. And this is where Bayes' theorem comes in to help us. He actually needs to have four pieces of data to calculate his likelihood of being immune. First, he does need to know his antibody test result. Did he test positive or did he test negative? Well, we know he tested positive as if he was immune. But the thing is, like all medical tests, COVID-19 COVID antibody tests are imperfect. They do not have perfect accuracy. They, they make mistakes. Which brings us to the next two things that he needs to know. He needs to know how accurate the test is in two different ways. The first way that he needs to know about is, is the accuracy among people who really did have COVID. So for most of those people who really did have COVID, the test is really accurate. The test is gonna say that they really did have it and they'll test positive. 
In fact, in fact, guidelines from the Infectious Diseases Society of America, um, they, they, they recommend tests that are correctly positive more than 96% of the time. So of all the COVID positive people, 96% of them are going to be accurately told, yes, you, 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 had, you had COVID, you, you have the antibodies. Um, you, might, you might, by the way, have heard of this called, um, this is sometimes called the hit rate of the test. And 96% accuracy is great. It's a really accurate test in that way but it's imperfect because 4% four, four of the people who really did have COVID, they, have, they really do have COVID um, antibodies, will test negative as if they did not. So next is the, the other test characteristic that he needs to know about. Let's think about the people who really didn't have COVID. For most of them, the test is gonna say that they didn't have it, they're gonna test negative. And in fact, guidelines from the same Infectious Disease Society of America uh, they recommends tests that are correctly negative more than 99.5% of the time. So I'm actually going to use 99% here just to show, um, just to make showing you the math a little bit easier. Um, but, but again, this, this, um, this characteristic of the test is also really accurate and even more so than the first character characteristic. So Doug is feeling pretty good at this point. He's, he's, tested po he's tested positive and his test is accurate and it's accurate in two different ways. But it turns out that Doug needs to know um, uh, one more thing. The final thing he needs to know is what we call his, his base rate of disease. Um, and, and it's basically based on, based on everything that he knows before getting the test, what's the likelihood that he would have had COVID? So for some people, it's the prevalence of the disease in their, in their county or in their country. They don't have any better information because they haven't had any clear symptoms. This is like Doug. Um, they haven't been in contact with anyone they know who had it, and they haven't had any prior test results themselves. For other people, their base rate might be higher um, because they've had symptoms. They've had really clear COVID and they were definitely in contact. But, but for Doug, he didn't know a lot. He thought he had symptoms, mild symptoms, but he, um, but he didn't know much beyond that. So, he, so for him, we're going to have to use the prevalence of the disease at the time because he just didn't know anything more. And way back in February, experts estimated that less than 1% of the population had been infected. So we're going to use 1% as the base rate of the disease, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. So originally, Doug thought that he only needed to know his test result, but it turns out that he really needed to know all four of these things. And now what we can do is we can use um, this information to calculate his likelihood of being immune um, with this theorem that's called Bayes' theorem. This theorem is used, uh, we're gonna use it today, but it's, it's actually used in lots of different circumstances. It's used in medicine, like we'll do today in a moment, but it's also used in finance and genetics and political science and historical studies. Um, for example, it's been used in analyzing racial disparities in policing. Um, so for example, in, in the assessment of officer decisions to search drivers during a traffic stop or during search and rescue operations um, that, that, that allow people to, to narrow down the search area as new data is added. But today, we're gonna use it in one very specific way. We're gonna use it for COVID. So first, let me show you the, the hard way of doing it. And we're not gonna spend much time on this. One way of calculating, um, one way of calculating uh, is to use the Bayes' theorem formula. And I've written it in two different forms here. I'm not gonna even bother explaining it today because it takes a while to understand it. Um, but what I found when I, when I teach my undergraduate students is that they have a tough time with the formulas and there are better ways to explain this and to help you understand the math. So what we're gonna do instead of trying to go through, um, instead of trying to go through and explain the formula to you, we're gonna do it more intuitively. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with an imaginary 10,000 people who are just like Doug. So you just have to imagine 10,000 people just like Doug. And we're gonna use all four of our pieces of information to try to figure out, given that Doug actually tested positive, what's the likelihood that he actually is immune? That's what we're, that's what we're headed towards. But we're gonna take it one step at a time. So first, we start with this imaginary 10,000 people. And the first piece of information we're gonna use is his prior likelihood of having had COVID. That's the base rate I mentioned a minute ago. Remember, he, he didn't know much at the time other than he thought he might've had mild symptoms um, and less than 1% of the population at the time had been infected. So that's the 1% we're gonna use. We're gonna use that 1% as our estimate of how many people like Doug were infected. So taking 1% of 10,000 reveals that 100 people like him were actually immune and the remaining 9,900 9, people were not immune. 
So that's how we get the 100 over here. It's 1% 1 of 10,000. And then the remaining 99% are not immune. Then we use the first test characteristic. Remember, there are two test characteristics. We're going to take them one at a time because we need to do that. It's care it, you need to be just very careful and systematic. So we know from our discussion before that, that the test was really accurate. And in fact, of people who really are immune, 96% of them will test positive. So 96% of the 100 people who really are immune are going to be correctly told um, that, that, um, uh, that, they're, that they're positive. The test is not perfect though, remember. So the remaining four out of that 100 people tested negative, negative, even though they really did have COVID antibodies. Because again, remember the tests aren't perfect, but this one is actually pretty good. And then we go on to use the second test characteristic. Uh, of those 9,900 people who are not immune, uh, we know that 99% will correctly test negative, but 1%, unfortunately, will be incorrectly told that they were positive for the antibody. It's a good test, but again, it's imperfect. So 1% of the 9,999, <coughs> excuse me, um, means, that means that 99 people who are not immune are actually going to be told that they are, even though they're not really. And then we get to use our last piece of, uh, we, we get to use the last of our four pieces of information. That last piece is, is what Doug had in the beginning. It's just that he tested positive. And so what we're gonna do now, given that he tested positive, we're gonna calculate the likelihood that he actually has COVID antibodies and is immune. And what you do is you take all of those people who are immune on the left side of the screen, so they're immune and they tested positive, uh, that's 96 people, and then we're gonna divide it by all the people who actually tested positive, because remember, there, there are correct positives, but there are also incorrect positives. Um, and so that's going to be the 96, the 96 people who tested correctly positive here. And then the 99 people who, te who tested positive, but they actually were not. It was a mistake. And so if you take 96 divided by the combination of 96 and 99, it turns out that the answer is, point, is 0.49. So 96 divided by 195, 195 is 0.49. 49 or 49 percent. What that means is that Doug's likelihood of being immune, given all four pieces of the information, is only 49 percent. So we return to our question, because this is about decision making, and it's about evidence-based decision making. Should he travel or not? Well, now we have a bit more evidence. Before, we only knew that he tested positive, as if he was immune. And if we made a choice based just on that information, then he can definitely travel. But now we know better. Doug's likelihood of being immune, given all the information above, is only 49%. It's like flipping a coin, whether or not he's immune, despite the fact that he tested positive. If you thought COVID was a serious issue, would you travel happily with these odds of being immune? And there are other things we can do with Bayes' theorem. We can, for example, remember I said that all four pieces of information were, were important? Well, we can change one of the pieces of information and look to see what happens. Uh, at, at the time that Doug thought that he had COVID, uh, about 1% of the population had had, had 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 COVID. But recently, our Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, said that that number is up to about 10% overall across the whole U.S. So about 10% of the U.S. population has had COVID at this point, according to the CDC's best estimates. So let's imagine Doug thinks he had COVID this month instead. We're going to keep all the other information the same, and we're going to recalculate his, uh, his odds. And what you're going to see is that changing only the base rate of the disease, the 1% up to 10%, will make a really big difference to how informative this test is for him. So we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to start again with an imaginary 10,000 people like Doug and use our four pieces of information. But you're going to see the numbers um, change subtly. So now his prior likelihood is 10%. His, his prior likelihood of having had COVID is 10% instead of the 1% we used before. And taking 10% of 10,000 reveals that 1,000 people like him were immune and the remaining 9,000 were not. Then, just like before, we're going to use the first test characteristic. We know the test was 96% 90, accurate. So if we take 96% of these people, we know that 960 people correctly tested positive as if they were immune, but 4% didn't. Um, uh, th this 4% were incorrectly, were incorrectly told. And then we go on to our second test characteristic. Of those 9,000 people who are not immune, 99% will, will correctly test negative. It's an accurate test, but 1% unfortunately will be told that they, were that they were positive for the antibody. Again, a good test, but imperfect. 
1% times 9,000 means that 90 people who are not immune will be told that they are. And now we go to our last piece of information. Given that Doug tested positive, what's the likelihood that he actually has COVID antibodies and is immune? Again, we take all of those people who are immune, who are on the left side of the screen and they tested positive, that's the 960 people now, and you divide it by all of the people who tested positive, whether the test was correct or not, and that's 960 here uh, with 90 people here or a total of 1,050 people. And now 960 divided by 1,050 is 0.91 or 91%. Doug's likelihood now of being immune, given all four pieces of information, is now 91%, even though we only changed the base rate of disease from 1% to 10%. And we go back to his question, should he travel? Now, again, with these four pieces of information, his likelihood of being immune is much higher. It's 91%. The test is much more informative now, just because his likelihood for having had the disease, his prior likelihood, was higher now. It's 10% instead of 1%. Now, mind you, his likelihood of being immune given the positive test result is 91%. He still, of course, has a 9% chance of not being immune, even though he tested positive. So you always want to keep that in mind. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of take you through the math those two times just to kind of give you an intuitive flavor for how you can go ahead um, and calculate this and sort of have a, an understanding of, of how the numbers kind of balance each other out. And now I'm just going to give you a couple of other examples because we can change other pieces of information too. So the test accuracies that I used before were 96% for correct positives and 99% for correct negatives. Let's just switch them up a little bit. So we're gonna still keep them really accurate, but we're gonna um, change them to 99% for the correct positives and 95% now for correct, for correct negatives. I'm not gonna go through the whole calculation this time, but it turns out if you do go through all the calculations, his chances of being immune are now only 69%. And the question again is, he has evidence and he wants to make a good, high quality, evidence-based decision about whether he should travel. And would you, would you do it? You, you would have a 69% of, 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 of being immune, but a 31% chance remaining that you might not be immune even though you got a positive test result. So what have we learned? First and foremost, we've learned that just because Doug tested positive does not mean that he's immune because tests are imperfect. Instead, he needs to know those four pieces of information, only one of which is that he tested positive for the antibodies. But here are some other important points. To predict a rare event, and a, a rare event was like when, um, when Doug originally thought he had COVID, there was only 1% one, only 1 of the population had actually had it at that point, as far as we could tell. To predict a rare event, you need a test with spectacularly high accuracy, and such a test may not always exist. If you don't have such a wonderful test, you could just go with the base rate. For Doug, that would have meant that he estimated his likelihood of being immune as, one per, as only 1%, even though he tested positive for COVID antibodies. Using the test accuracies, he did a little better. He got more information. He found out that he had a 49% chance of being immune, which is a big improvement, but was it enough that he felt free to travel? Because he had some symptoms, some symptoms that could have been COVID, he could have decided that 1% was too low to think about as a base rate. And he could have um, sort of intuitively, subjectively decided that he needed to start with some higher number as his base rate. So maybe he started with 25% for his base rate, for example. Um, it, that, that's a judgment call at that point that would, of course, have, have increased his final calculation substantially. It would have made the, the final test look much more informative um, but he would have been guessing about what his base rate would have been. So to me, Bayes' theorem is, is, as I said before, it's one of the, my favorite things that I teach to my undergrads, but it's also one of the most important things. And that's part of why it's one of my favorite things. Right now, if you want to rely on, a, on an antibody test to decide whether you can go out into the public without fear of infection, it's potentially a matter of life or death for you or someone you care about. So what should you do? First, find out about more than just your test result. Just your test result is not enough. Also, update your prior information. Know your base rate for disease. The higher your prior likelihood of having had COVID, the more likely a positive antibody test is true, the more, the more informative that test result is. Also, know about how accurate your medical test actually is. 
Under its, emergency author, under its emergency authority, the FDA has authorized a whole series of these different um, antibody tests, but they actually vary in accuracy quite a bit from about 83% right now up to 100%. When I looked back about a month or two ago, it was actually much lower. The, the tests range from something like 67% up to 100% accuracy at that point in time. So they've gotten better. But if your base rate is low as it was for Doug, the more accurate the test is overall, and especially for the true negative rate, the more informative that test is gonna be for you. But it's important to understand how accurate the medical test is. Um, these, these accuracies nonetheless are estimated under perfect test circumstances. And you should keep in mind that your testing circumstances could have been imperfect. For example, you might've been infected too recently so that the antibodies haven't developed yet. Um, as I understand it, it takes um, somewhere, somewhere around a couple of weeks for them to develop. Uh, but also, there's not enough evidence yet to know how long these antibodies last or whether a past infection with the virus protects you from getting another infection. Because medical tests are not entirely accurate, you, need to main, you should maintain a belief that a test result that you prefer, because we prefer to be immune, that a test result that you prefer might be wrong. So keep an open mind. The last point that I wanted to emphasize is that statistics can help people make better choices. We looked at this one example of Bayes' theorem and traveling today, um, but, but simpler examples exist too. For example, if you're trying to decide whether or not to wear a mask, did, did you know that scientists have estimated that if 80% of, of the population wearing masks would do more to reduce COVID-19 spread than a strict lockdown? Maybe you're trying to decide about whether to go to an important event at work or at school. Did you know that you run seven to eight times more risk of running into a, at least one COVID positive person at a party with 100 people compared to one with only 10 people? That's something that we call the relative risk. In terms of absolute risk, if we took, um, I, I went ahead and looked at Lane County infection rates today. And if we, given those infection rates today and assuming that nobody's isolating, there was a 53% chance that at least one COVID positive person would be at a 100 person event compared to um, there being only a 7% chance of, of a COVID positive person at a, 10 per, at a 10 person event. Presenting statistics can help people weigh risk in important decisions. And these are just the kinds of complex problems that we're tackling at the Center for Science Communication Research. We, we call it SCR. And this is the research center uh, that I direct on the U of O campus. Our vision is to lead science communication research that improves evidence-based decision-making for individuals as well as for policymakers. And of course, we also teach our students about best methods for science communication. Science is complex, but our messages don't have to be. I'll wind up by saying that using science is key to making good decisions, and there is a science to communicating it. This science of science communication should be used so that people can understand and use science to make high quality, evidence-based decisions in their lives. And this is critical today when individuals are the ultimate actors who determine how well they themselves do, but they also help to determine how well we do as a society. So what did Doug do? Did he choose to get his get out of jail free card? He really, really wanted to. Um, in the end, he didn't. He actually didn't use his get out of jail free card. Um, he had two more antibody tests done and he tested positive both times, making it highly, highly likely that he was immune. However, he's a really good guy. Instead of traveling, he actually stayed home. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's been donating plasma as frequently as he's been allowed, as frequently as he's been allowed, and he may have helped save the lives of other patients. He does plan to travel once the pandemic is over. So thank you so much for your attention. If you're interested in learning more about numbers and decision-making, I do have a book out this year. I have a code on the screen. Uh, if you went to Oxford University Press and used that code, you could actually get 30% off the book. Uh, and if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them now. Thank you so much, Alan. That was excellent. Um, we have one question that's come in, but it would require you to have watched a video previously and they want you to respond to something that someone had said in it. So um, we'll just assume that you have not had a chance to previously watch that and reflect on it. Um, it's about T cells and their role in immunity. Um, so if anyone else has a question, please feel free to post it in 
the chat feature or the Q&A feature on Zoom um, or in the comment box on the Facebook live stream. Uh, we have someone else who's saying they have no questions because you gave a very clear and easy to understand talk um, Thank and you. they're thanking you for the timeliness of it. So I second that. Um, I think that was a really excellent way um, to understand what these tests are telling us um, and the, the graphics helped me um, and I know I've been trying to explain to members of my family that the tests are not necessarily as accurate as they think that they are. Um, so I'm glad to have a resource to point them to now to have them watch it um, and be able to understand a little bit better. Um, someone is asking whether there are other resources that they can use to learn more about Bayes' theorem. Do you have anything you could point them toward? I do. In fact, I have a slide that has um, five different things that you could go take a look at. Um, I'm not sure what I can share the screen again, but there might be a better way Oh, you know what I should do? Actually, I can put them in the chat box. Okay, me, that would be I'm gonna copy and paste them. It's gonna take me just a minute to get to the right slide because of no course problem. everything will be arranged. Let's see. Being able to do this kind of stuff remote is amazing and horrifying all at the same time because <laughs> we can really just do so much. So the formatting is terrible. I apologize to everybody. This is, they're bullet points on my slide. Um, uh, but what it is, it's one, two, three, four. It's five, it's five different, um, mostly newspaper articles uh, that I thought you guys might find interesting if, if you're interested in learning more um, specifically ab about uh, Bayes' theorem. Because it is, it's a really, really interesting, um, it's a really, really interesting way of thinking about things because this is relevant to COVID antibody tests, but it's also relevant to things like mammogram results. It's relevant to genetic testing results, especially if you have a very low likelihood of disease. Remember that base rate we talked about? And none of these tests, they're, they're great tests, but they're imperfect. And it means that we get these false positives that can, that can add up, especially for these very low li like likelihood diseases. And the test itself then becomes less informative. You can have a test, be you can make a test be more informative. That's not quite the right language. But if you get a second test, that actually does help the informativeness. Because if you go in thinking that you have a very low likelihood of disease, let's say that 1% that Doug started off with, and you test positive, and now suddenly you know you have a 49% chance of having the antibodies, that 49% that then becomes your base rate as you go into the next time you test positive. And so then it's much more informative if you've tested positive twice. So the, these concepts are, are um, it's why I like teaching them to undergrads. They're really important from a medical standpoint. And, and I hope it's helping, I hope it helps you guys today, and I hope the readings help somewhat. I hope so too. Um, we did have one more question come in. Someone is wondering, what advice do you have for journalists reporting on COVID-19 tests and results to make information more digestible and understandable to readers? Yeah, uh, so uh, Sally, I hope you don't mind my calling you Sally. I think we've spoken a little bit by email. Um, part, so part of what I do is, um, is explain this idea. It, it's basically what I talked about today. And, th and this is why I find it so important that you can't just rely on you tested positive. And you also can't just rely on the test accuracies. In some ways, um, from a science communication perspective, I think really all we, should be, all, all we should be actually communicating to someone who tests positive is how informative is that test? What's the likelihood, given that test result, um, that, that you actually are immune? Um, and, and that, so in a sense, what we wanna be communicating- oh, to we lost your sound result. there, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah, I don't know what, uh, you know, internet, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Maybe it was just me. <laughs> you know, fr from a science communication perspective, um, if you have the time, you can walk people through all of those calculations that I showed. And what I found with students is, is if I spend a little bit of time going through different examples, they actually are able to form a pretty good intuitive idea. They might not remember how to do the calculation, but at least they understand this idea that, that just because you tested positive, doesn't mean that you, in this case, you have the antibodies. Um, and so in the end, what I think we need to be telling people is that final number. I think we need to be telling people, given that test result and this other stuff that you need to be taking into account, the likelihood that you actually have the antibodies is X percent. 
Um, and for some people, it's going to be really low, uh, like, uh, like it was for Doug at first. He had only, you know, it's basically a coin flip. He had a 49% chance of actually having been, um, actually having the antibodies. But for other people, it's going to be much higher. And it's going to depend on the population that you're coming from, as well as those test characteristics. And Sally, I'm happy to talk with you about this further if you want. That's so kind of you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from anybody? Give you a few more minutes to try and ask them while we have the time. Oh, Sally says thank you. If you did not You're see welcome. already. <laughs> Well, we are still waiting to see if any further questions come in. Is there anything else that um, you would like to share with people or anything else that you hope they would take home um, after or not take home? We are all at home now <laughs> <laughs> um, after hearing your talk tonight or um, other examples from maybe not. I know you mentioned genetic testing, which I found interesting. Um, my family has a history of having some of those tests done and I have never had a doctor explain to me um, how accurate those results would be. So I'll have to yes. revisit some of that, but are there other examples that people might encounter in their day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, so the, the most famous examples actually come from HIV AIDS um, because uh, if you get test, if you test positive for HIV AIDS, uh, it is, um, it's again, it's an imperfect test. And so if you get a single, a single positive result for, for HIV, does not necessarily mean that you have the virus. Um, and the, the reason that the example is, is um, particularly well known is because doctors often don't understand that. Um, and so there's a study done uh, at one point, for example, with um, HIV AIDS counselors, where um, they, uh, they were um, supposedly interacting with somebody who had a very low risk of actually having HIV. The person was not gay. They did not. They they just weren't in a population that um, that would come into contact very often. So going back to what we were talking about before, their base rate for disease was very very low, and the counselor knew that from the person's characteristics. Um, but the person had tested positive. Most of the counselors could not figure out that did not mean that the person necessarily had HIV. They didn't counsel the person in a way to help them understand that. And so it, you know, it, it's one of those things in our lives as patients, because each of us is a patient too, um, that we need to know a little bit so that we can take charge of our health and ourselves, um, at least you might not be able to, you might, you, you probably won't remember how to calculate it from tonight, but you at least have a feel for it and you know to push back a little bit um, with the doctor and ask the doctor to go find that out for you and ask the doctor to present the information to you in a way that you can understand that you can digest it and you can use it to make good choices and take charge of your health yeah i feel like that's good advice just generally in the healthcare industry it, it's great to be your own advocate and to have an understanding of what's happening um, so but also in most things in life, um, a general understanding of the world around us is always helpful for us in all of the decisions that we make. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So I did see when um, I was writing the introduction that I gave for you earlier um, that you have done a little bit of research related to how um, people make decisions about the environment. So since we haven't had any more questions come in, I'm going to take us slightly off track, if you don't mind, sure. um, just with everything that's been happening um, with the holiday farm fire and the effects of climate change that we're seeing um, more and more. Um, we have a talk coming up in November where someone's going to be discussing why it is that people acknowledge that climate change is real, but don't necessarily make any changes or any decisions in their day-to-day -day lives um, to actually address that or do anything about it. So um, I don't know if by the environment you study climate change at all, um, but if you do and you have anything to add along those lines, I would certainly be interested in hearing it. Yeah, so I, um, th th it's, not, it's not a major um, thrust of my research, but I, but I do a little bit a little bit in it and I read a little bit. Um, a, lo a lot of my friends do more research in this area than I do. 
you know, wh when you're looking at somebody who, um, who under, you know, who understands that climate change uh, is a serious problem, um, uh, and 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 recognizes and appreciates the science the science that exists around climate change. You're right that nonetheless a lot of people don't take action, and there there can be a variety of different reasons for that. Um, one that I haven't studied in environmental areas, I've studied in other areas, uh, but I know it's also very relevant within the envir environmental domain, is that people often don't have um, don't have the confidence that they can do anything. They don't have the confidence that any action of theirs um, is going to actually make a difference. Uh, it's a concept in psychology that we call self-efficacy and, and, and also the a related concept called response efficacy. But, but the basic idea is, okay, yeah, I know this is a horrible problem, but I don't know what I can do that would make any kind of a difference. And um, if, if, if you feel that way, it kind of shuts down the, any avenue for action because there, there's nothing that you feel is going to make a difference. That, that's, what, that's one reason why um, I think people don't, don't end up taking action. Um, an, another reason that I've, that I've read about uh, is the idea that um, you, might be, you might believe in the science, you might be even fearful to some extent at least about what might happen to, to us um, in the near future and especially in the, in the further away. Um, further in further away in time and especially for future generations and you might go ahead and take a step like um, replacing your light bulbs for example with something that's more environmentally friendly um, or um, buying a, 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 an electric car rather than a car that that burns fossil fuels and but what, what ends up happening psychologically is if you take that one step you often feel satisfied <laughs> um, because well I've you know I've, I've done my part and suddenly it doesn't even if you don't feel like it's your part, it, the urgency of feeling the need to do something, you, you've kind of fed it a little bit. So you feel a little bit better, even though you recognize the problem is still there. Um, but, but that's one of the, the, the psychological things that can happen. Um, doing one thing can end up making us feel like, I'm done, I've, I've done what I can. Thank you for indulging me on taking us completely off topic from- Yeah, yeah happy to. <laughs> Um, well, we haven't had any more comments or questions come in um, other than one person who just seconded the um, previous comment that they found tonight's talk really helpful um, and that she's studying health information management and is really appreciative. Um, oh, that's cool. That's a cool yeah. topic. So um, we'll go ahead and end it there. I want to thank you again so much for giving us your time tonight and tuning in um, virtually. I know some of these talks can be um, a little bit tricky. And so we really appreciate all of our speakers who have been um, willing to work with us in the virtual world. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, and I just want to remind you again, I have dropped the link for the survey um, into the chat feature in both Facebook and Zoom. Um, and also, if you enjoyed the talk, which it seems like some of you have, I hope you'll consider making a donation to the museum to help us support um, these types of programs and so that we can continue to bring them to everyone free of charge. 